watch him go chop that white boy's head off, you say, oh, baby, good job. Make him a good job, too. We got to change some things. All right? Y'all all right? All right. We ain't going to go deep into this, brothers and sisters. We ain't going to go deep in this because I said we're going to be stepping on some toes in here today. We don't even want to talk about the sexual madness that's going on in the black community. I mean, no, sir, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm only going to mention it. I'm not going to say why I'm not going to talk about it, but we ain't going to go too deep into it. I don't want to step on my own toes, too. But I'm going to say this. We have a whole series of things dealing with the sexual madness going on in our community, brothers and sisters. In Feminization of the Black Male series, part one, two, three, and four, we have Predators in Our Midst, which deals with the epidemic of child sexual abuse in the black community. We have the book, War on the Horizon, Black Resistance to the White Sex Assault. And if you're interested in any of these products, you can go to that number there you see, or, or either one of the uh, websites and, and purchase it. I don't want to spend a lot of time with this because we got a lot of ground to cover, but suffice it to say, brothers and sisters, the European is, was, and will always be a completely sexually degenerate monster on this planet. I mean, from them savagely, the homos grabbing our children to their sexual perversion, to the masochism, to the love that they've always had for whatever reason. They found the little white male as the most desirable sexual object. And then now they got organizations like NAMBLA, whose sole stated purpose is to go after little boys. This is a boy right here. This is their bulletin publication. Even Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the two transvestites that do South Park, Got episodes I love now. I mean, just a feel. I mean, North American Man Boy Love Association. Wow. They were part of, you know, they were part of the inception of the gay rights movement. Right. Yeah. Pedophiles were a major source in the whole gay rights movement. Yeah. That's what we got to understand. Look, come on, this is bad. Anytime you got a presidential candidate that's a transvestite, this Rudy Giuliani. Right. Right. I mean, Fruity Giuliani. Right. 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 I mean, he's, listen, he's a transvestite. On a regular basis, he's dressing with female in, in females' clothing. You know that when he, uh, when, when the planes hit the towers, where he was living, he had divorced his wife. He was living with two homosexuals he knew from college. He was living in that condo. And I wouldn't live with a homosexual prayer, but a condo definitely ain't big enough. You have to, I might live in a city with a fag, but I ain't living in no house with one, and much less a condo. Might have been a one room, I don't know. Going over, going over to Iraq, I mean, the bestiality, I mean, brothers and sisters, but the problem, we expect them to be like that. But when Martin Luther King said, we want little black boys and little white boys to be holding hands. Well, we got your integrated dream. <laughs> we holding hands now. Has it helped us at all? And no matter how you turn this thing, we are getting turned out. You cannot walk a day on this planet. Look, if you're in the D.C. area, I'm sure the Los Angeles area, Atlanta, I ain't even going to say the word. I, oh, man, did I say the word Atlanta? Whoa. <laughs> you can't even say, listen, any major metropolitan area, we're going to do a lecture. we got to do one soon on lesbianism. It's, it is now part of black culture. I'm not going to say it's coming here. Lesbianism is black culture now. It's, I mean, we went out uh, recently, and Brother Kush almost had to punch me in the face because I refuse to believe that we saw as many lesbians as we saw because I just don't want it to be real. We didn't see a straight sister, Holly. I mean, I was like, man, this is, this is outlandish. Brothers and sisters, we are getting turned out completely. Now nah, that's your boy. That ain't my boy. He was my boy if he dead. <laughs> I want him dead. I'm not going to lie to you. Like I said like this. I want to be proud of the day when somebody blows his goddamn brains out and I can say, well, I had something to do with that. He urinated on my daughter. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I want him dead. I want to be, this. I think I'm joking. I don't drink and I don't smoke. But I might take me a sip that night. <laughs> I, look, brothers and sisters, we live in Rome. To some degree, we've learned some real bad habits. To some degree, we do some of the things the Romans do. I ain't going to shoot too hard at nobody because I had to shoot at myself. I mean, some of us taking some trips to Italy. Some of us a little worse. We've been to France. But now, we got to stop the madness somewhere, brothers and sisters. And I'm saying, there's some places that got to stop. Men cannot be sexually engaged with other men. That's not, there's no room anywhere among Africans for that misbehavior. No, Women cannot be sexually engaged with one another. Nowhere on this planet as Africans is no, unacceptable. No, Adults cannot go after children sexually. It is unacceptable. No, 
You should not be able to walk anywhere amongst us, nowhere among us, unless you can walk horizontally. It's unacceptable. And I'm saying to my brothers and sisters on the African continent in particular, you got the kind of power there that we don't have here. Finish this problem. Deal with it now. You have no idea what it's going to mean for you in the future. Let's stop going and traveling in the caves and hills of Europe acting like white folk. Africans do not have male-male sexual relationships. We do not have female-female relationships. We do not have adult sexual interaction with children on any level. It's unacceptable. If you've done it, never do it again. And we got to go out here and make it stop, brothers and sisters. That's our responsibility to our future generation. At least we can give them that. At least we can give a little black child the solace and the, 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 the understanding that they don't have to be sexually ravaged. If we can get that accomplished before we leave this planet, we've done something major for the future of our race. I put this Negro up here. I mean, you and they know not doing it. I said, you know, a lot of times, you know, you got quotes and stuff about stuff. And I said, you know, Pedophilia is so far out of African culture. I don't know if anyone's ever made a specific quote for it. So I said, well, you know what I did. If ain't nobody else done, done it, <laughs> why not do it? I said, the new African is committed to ensuring that any person who sexually abuses a black child has simultaneously dug his or own, her own grave. That's, right. That's, That's got to be opposition, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Suffice it to say, y'all ain't sound too enthusiastic about that. What, y'all like pedophiles? understand that's what I'd have stood up on. <laughs> I, look, I'm being serious. It's part of my life's work. I want to I wanna die knowing that on some level, if I can look my ancestors in the face and my youth in the face and say, I did everything I could do to stop you from suffering sexual abuse. I tried. I want to be able to at least say that I tried. We got to work, brother, says that this is the most important thing we can do for the sanity of our people is to stop this madness in our communities. So now we got to get, we talked about earlier, now we got to get right down. We're talking about real integration. Let's talk about it. Miscegenation, race mixing. It's a statement by Astro Kwesi. I thought it was a very powerful statement. He said, for any black man to sleep with a white woman is like spitting in your mother's womb. That's a graphic thought, ain't it? That's what it is, though, brothers and sisters. We, 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 we don't understand what happens. So I said, you know, how do we approach this? I can sit up here and tell you how wrong it is. I said... Let's talk about warfare. Let's talk about strategy. Let's talk about why the black male, how it's done. How is it that the black male sees the white female as the standard of beauty? You see it right here? Now I want to do this, brothers and sisters. We don't have time to really get in depth with this, but I want you to understand. For over 5,000 years, they used different warfare tactics, psychological warfare tactics in the black community, all over the world. This is what the European has done to create the white female as the standard of beauty amongst black people. I'm doing this because so many sisters ask me, why do our brothers do this when they make money? Why do they always abandon us? What are we doing wrong? I want you to understand what you're doing wrong is we're not teaching our children responsibly as it relates to race. There you go. It is warfare. Take a look right here. And once again, I'm only going to do this. We're going to take a look at some things because I just want to plant the seed in your mind for you to understand it is not a natural state of affairs that black men naturally prefer women other than black women. Men are naturally curious about women outside their race, but they don't naturally prefer them. It is warfare targeted at the minds of black males that creates this. So we see right here, we see who is the object of his affection here. Targeting him at a very young age. We're about to watch two clips very quickly, brothers and sisters. We're going to watch two clips. And this is what we're going to do. I want you to imagine for a minute. I want you to think about the fact that as black people, let me just get this thing going here. As black people, we teach our children almost nothing about race. As a matter of fact, what we tell our children, correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't matter the race of who you fall in love with. What matters is their character and that you love the person, so forth and what have you. Isn't that what we teach our children? Very few of us tell our child the only acceptable partner for you, young lady, will be a black man. Very few of us see my child, look, young lady, uh, young, young man, the only acceptable partner for you when you get older will be a black male. Very few of us tell our children, hey, if you date outside the race, you abandon me, you leave me. Now, some people are smiling at me because they say, I did that. No, I didn't say you suggested. I'm saying very few of us talk straight talk. You ain't coming in my house. I don't know too many people who talk like that. I know, I tell I tell my young people in my family, and you can go ask them, they remember these things. I said, there's three things you can't do, I don't know you. Anything else you do, I love you, we'll work it out. You can't be no pedophile, 
that's no children. Right. You can't be no faggot. Right. And you can't be no cracker love. Right. I'm not dealing, the only thing I don't like worse than crackers is cracker loving Negro. I'm telling you, I'm not dealing with it. If you make that decision, know that you divorced me. Don't say, well, I won't speak to you. You decided you weren't going to speak to me. Why do I do it? Because if we teach our children right, if we teach them when they're young and they know it's wrong, look, dating outside your race, particularly dating whites in particular, right. it's just as wrong as stealing. It's wrong like it's wrong. That's Forget right. all these fancy. It's wrong. It's inherently wrong. Right. The only acceptable partner for an African is another African. That's right. And so I'm saying, brothers and sisters, we're going to watch this because I want, I want us to understand how do they target our youth so that the end result is what we see all of these brothers running after white females. Y'all ready? Yes, we're going to look at cartoons. We're going to look at cartoons. I know you're saying, why are we going to look at some cartoons? Because I want you to understand, while we're sitting around not thinking about warfare, Europeans are warring on every single possible level. Why cartoons? Cartoons are directed towards who? Yes. Let's see what the message in this cartoon is. What's he? Uh, is he? Uh, I think he is. Are you damaged? He, he did. did. Why in the world do you think I'd ever go out with Midtown High's champion geek? Hey, Rand, Puny Parker's hitting on your girl. Uh, Rand, I, I didn't know you two were... School. Cool? You don't care? Why? You want to go out with him? I want to walk on a Parker-free planet, thank you very much. Now, I just want you to stop. I know people say, well, I mean, you know, okay. If it's a cartoon, somebody had to draw that, right? Right. Is it possible that it's an accident that the young white female was dating a black man. No, sir. Is it possible somebody accidentally colored him black? No, sir. Then what's the message? I want you to notice the characteristics of that black man. He's a football player, right? Big, strong black man. So who is supposed to be the object of the strong, successful black male's affection? The white female. Now why are they putting this in cartoon? Who are they targeting? Who's sitting down looking up at this and saying, I want to be like that. What is my prize when I'm like that? I only showed that one because that one don't really get it done. I only showed it because I didn't want anybody to say, well, he's just picking stuff out. Now I'm going to show you how they do it. Look, while we going to work and doing everything we're doing and not being racially responsible, the white folks are not like that. They are telling our children and giving them a message. Let's take a look. We're going to look at one more of these that gives the message to our sons. Important to understand. This is called the Justice League. It's the super friend. You know, Superman and all these super. You know children like superheroes, right? All right. He's called a group. That machine is Thanagarian technology. It's a telepathic database, more complex than anything on Earth, and it's broken. She might be right. When I touched it before, the feedback. Hush now. Watch and learn. Years ago, two Thanagarian law officers found themselves stranded on a primitive planet. This planet. Katar and Shayera Hall used their technology to make the desert bloom and build the greatest city on Earth. The people loved them, and despite their protests, worshipped them as gods. For decades, their ever-growing empire was a utopia. But nothing lasts forever. At least, nothing good. What troubles you, Shaira? Why ask what you already know? I want to bear I your child, I don't want to have Kitar. this conversation again. Why the hurry? You're a young woman. There's plenty of time. Thirty or forty years at most. I'm not a girl anymore. You look the same as you did the day I met you. When my work is complete, after I've tamed this savage continent... You'll set out to conquer the rest of the world. It's my duty. We owe these people the peace and stability that comes from Thanagarian rule. I'm not arguing that. But you also have a duty to continue your bloodline. Or are you so tired of me that you don't even I want... love you, Shair Hall. Nothing will ever change that. It's just that right now, I need to concentrate on... Hail King Kazar! Hail, Queen Shaira! Bashari, no need to stand on ceremony, my friend. What news do you bring? Victory! 
The land of Kondok has been freed from Octon's rule and placed under your benevolent protection. As tribute, Teth Adam sends 100 of the finest stallions on Earth. My husband and I travel on the winds, General. What good are horses to us? I'll show you. Save some for me. Hey. <laughs> I should have kept it for myself. You're wasting it. Katar's my husband. And my best friend. I'd leave him for you. I'd never ask. I'm afraid that you would. Katar needs you. And I need you. You didn't have to do that. I can fly. When we're together, so can I. I wish they were dead. Ain't no child show. We don't. We the only one childing around. Other people have agendas. See, see, see. White folks, they war on a whole different level, brothers and sisters. They, they, they have whole different objectives. While we sitting around telling our children it don't matter who they go after, black woman, the European is stealing your husbands. He's stealing your husbands from your daughters. He's training because what this is really about. What this is really about, brothers and sisters. What it's really about. is targeting black people economically. See, the white female is the recruit and always has been. When black people had powerful nations, he recruited the white female to go in and marry into those bloodlines so they could seize power from black people. Well, you say, well, we don't have any powerful empires today. No, we don't. But the European knows that there's one class that can change and, and get the people out of their condition. And that's the group that can finance revolution. There is no revolution without finance. And so what the Europeans said, since we're going to allow whites, black people in and in, let them integrate into the society, the richest, the most powerful, the most successful black men, white, female, you go after them and you arrest their development. We never have to worry about them giving a penny or spending one moment trying to help their race. That's, right. that's why you see Bill Cosby with all his riches helping black people, who does he have at home? He got to go home to a black woman who looks him in the face and says, look at our condition. You have better, so you should do better. Do any of these niggas, we're looking at billions of dollars go before us, brothers and sisters. Billions of dollars of resource. Billions, some, maybe even more than that, power, influence in the media. But none of them will contribute anything to our race. So whites do not have to worry about any movement. They target our youth to see this as their reward. When we ain't looking and we, we still trying to integrate and love everybody and their message is take the power for change away from them, go right into their pockets and you don't have to worry about them doing anything. And these Negroes, I mean, I mean, he just went out the, I mean, Clarence Thomas, I mean, got a big jolly fat rancher looking cracker. I mean, look like he went to Looks like he went with Matthew Henson to the North Pole and just cracked one of them pieces of ice and harpooned his big fat cracker. He must have had too many Christmas dinners. He went and got a big Santa Claus cracker. I mean, Dr. Carter said a Jurassic Park cracker, you know? See, that's a big dinosaur. So he went back in one of the time machines, put that big fat white dinosaur in the time machine and zapped her back. Brothers and sisters, this is real.
This is real warfare. We're going to take a break in one second, but I just want to show you one more video here. Because I know when I say it's economic warfare, I know some people say, well, you know, that just sounds like a little much. I mean, is it really that serious? I mean, is it, is it just somebody, two people loving each other? If you're in love with somebody, then that's what it's all about. Let's see if that's what it's all about. 97% of the replies from these white women go to white men. Which invites an economic test. How much more money would a man have to make before he'd become popular to women of another race? Here are the results. White women prefer white men but respond equally to profiles from Hispanic men if they make $77,000 a year more, to black men only if they make $154,000 a year more, and to an Asian man, a quarter million dollars more. 240? What? Really? You tend to need just an extra security deposit when you, when you go for someone outside of your own race. I can tell you, I can show you, right? She just said it just like this, look. Why the Hispanics now? Why do they prefer ones? Because the Hispanics are the ones fighting. We ain't doing nothing. So now they see the Hispanics on the rise. They use the same warfare they use with them with us. Now they're telling the white female recruits, the Hispanics are on the rise. Go marry into the powerful Hispanics so that if they ever decide that they're descendants of the Native Americans and they want some get back for the genocide that you did here, we already got them locked in. You right there, they land with the enemy. There will be no Finance revolution, there will be no revolution, there will be no change. We're going to take a break, brothers and sisters. We're going to come back and we're going to finish this off. Thank you, brothers and sisters. <laughs> the reason I'm a race man today is because my black mother decided before I was born that she wasn't going to have a Negro. She was going to have an African. And she gave me an African name. She started me off the right way. And I've been trying to do my best to go the right path ever since. I'm, I'm on it. I done strayed off a few times, though. <laughs> let me let you know. <laughs> I ain't gonna let you know too much, but uh, <laughs> I'm trying. Get, can y'all give me, show me some love? I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best. <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. Hey. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. Let me set the record straight. And I will lie to you. And that's one that I can say proudly. And I can add some spice to it because I was in Massachusetts. Let me say, Massachusetts. Some of y'all don't know what that means. That means you from the South, you thought you met some crackers. You ain't met no real crackers. Them crackers in the South still got a little southern hospitality. The real crackers is not down South. The real crackers is up South. But there ain't no black people. And they let you know they ain't no black people. And they never let you forget. And never once did I lay down with no horizontal integration with no crackers. So give me another, give me another round of applause. Shut up, shut me up, baby. That's all right, baby. Y'all need to stop talking so much, right? <laughs> Y'all all right? Yes, sir. All right, so we talked about what we see, that this ain't no accident. Because, see, sometimes we get confused because one minute the, the whites don't want integration. The next minute they do, we, we tell you, what's going on? Why are we seeing it? Why is it okay now? It's okay because they're coming after us, brothers and sisters. It's warfare. And we've got to get more sophisticated to be able to identify so that we can make appropriate steps in our own best interest. So, brothers and sisters, we talked about black males, it's economic warfare. What's going on with our sisters? Dr. Chancellor Williams tells us thousands of years, now this is thousands of years ago. Man, it's strange how when you don't know your history, you don't know your story, you continue to do it over and over again. It's an ancient Sumo legend. It said the, the traveler was traveling and he asked the old man, he said, what happened to the black people of Sumo? And the old man said, he said, he said the traveler said because we read the ancient records and it says all the people in Sumer were black people. What happened to them? And the old man sighed. He said, ah, they lost their history and so they died. And brothers and sisters, it's important that we know history because sometimes there ain't no other way to answer a question because it don't make no, it makes no sense. The only way you can add the pieces up is to go back and see what happened yesterday. Then you can understand what's happening today. 
He says, so anxious were some of these early black men for integration with whites that they did most in creating the new breed of Egyptians who would become their mortal enemies. In an all-out effort to appease the invaders, they freely gave their daughters as concubines. And then we ran out there and said, here, white folks, we want to, we, we trying to get in. And so here are our daughters. So I want to show you now, brothers and sisters, there's nothing that's done by accident these days. None of this is accidental. Let's see them as we see the Europeans promoting the next part of this agenda. ...of being classified as a victim. A oh. single black professional woman destined to be unhappy and alone. In the 2006 feature film, Something New, a successful female executive, frustrated by the lack of eligible black men in the dating pool, winds up falling for a white guy. You did what? With who? For Kenny. Yes. <laughs> A situation researchers say is becoming more and more commonplace. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, in just the last six years alone, the percentage of black wife, white husband couples has risen more than 20%. The statistics suggest that African-American women nationwide are rethinking their traditionally stringent rules about interracial dating. Is it a little more acceptable? It, it depends on the generation. I mean, it's basically finding someone that you connect with, race is really not important as long as you guys share something special. Would I date a white man? Yes, I would. They're calling it the quiet revolution, and experts believe women of color may be taking their cue from rich and powerful role models, like tennis sensation Venus Williams, who's dating pro golfer Hank Keeney, or supermodel Iman, who's been happily married to rocker David Boyd since 1992. Actor Shar Jackson has a history of dating across the color line. And former Miss America, Erica Dunlap, married marketing executive Brian Kleinschmidt earlier this year. So why are more and more African-American women crossing the racial divide? They say, why limit your options? You never know. The new Mr. Right could be... Mr. White. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. See, now we got to ask ourselves the question, brothers and sisters, because... Something's going on. White folks ain't never been happy to be putting on TV. She was happily married to actor David Bowie. They ain't just say he was married, she was happily married. What's going on? We, we said that with the men, with the black man, they're making sure that there's no revolution, no change coming out. It's an economic warfare. What is it that we're looking at now when we see Whites promoting it as okay and acceptable for white males to go after black women. This is going to really be very painful, brothers and sisters, because sisters, see, brothers thought that the white female loved them. Now he run, understands that all she wants is his money and to ensure the future of her race. And they don't mind taking a little bit of that melanin either to help make them healthier, because melanin actually, when whites take in that, that melanin from us and share it, it makes them healthier, it makes their organs stronger. It protects them from the ultraviolet rays of the sun with the global warming that's coming, it's very necessary, but that's economic warfare on behalf of the black man. She don't love him, she just wants his money. And she wanna make sure she has a future for a race, but what is this thing about with these white males going out to black women? Why are they promoting black women going to white males? Well, I want you to think now. Black men are out of the picture. They got us locked up and incarcerated. Right. Brothers don't know how to walk straight, switching and switching all kinds of different directions. Absolutely. See the most beautiful black woman in the world and don't nothing happen. If you're a black man and you see the most beautiful black woman in the world, I don't care how happily married you are, you're supposed to at least go, man, I'm not gonna look back at my wife right here next to me. I'm not gonna look back. And since if your man wants to look back but don't be happy for him, that means he's still a man, all right? But they got us off the set and now we see the European male coming in for the black woman. It's okay to date in, interracially. Matter of fact, that's preferred. Pushing is promoting it. The movie, uh, Something New. We saw saying, well, you know, you know a, white fe a black female made the movie, but who decided to put it on the big screen? Why are whites promoting this? The only way we can understand it, brothers and sisters, sometimes we got to look at history. Because there's nothing logical about what I'm about to share with you. It's only through history that we understand it. We go to a book, SBA. Let's give Asa Hilliard our ancestor. He's in the spiritual realm. Let's show him some love. In 1914, Theodore Roosevelt, don't read it now. I see some of y'all want to get ahead. I'm going to read it, all right? Stay with me, stay with me. 
1914, Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States, was talking to someone from Brazil. And the Brazilian was telling him, listen, the whites in Brazil were telling him, you all are dealing with your race problem with black people in the wrong way. He said, when you segregate them and leave them aside, they become stronger and they'll perpetually be a thorn in your side, always seeking power, always having a self-identity. You always have to deal with them from a position of power and them knowing who they are and wanting to be who they are. He said, you're dealing with your race problem wrong. These were his words to Theodore Roosevelt in Brazil. The idea looked forward to is the disappearance of the Negro question through the disappearance of the Negro himself. That is through his gradual absorption into the white race. The Brazilians, he went on to say the Brazilians are still white. In other words, he's saying, you know, because we always get this idea if a black person and somebody white have a child, it's a black child, but we don't know history. That has not been historically accurate. Historically, when whites have populations mm -hmm. of other people on this planet that they have attacked and assaulted, at some point in the process, they begin the process of mongrelization, which is really genocide. Because they say, now that the men are not on the scene, we're going to take the women, give them babies, and eventually they'll be absorbed into the white race. That is a constant warfare process of genocide that Europeans have been doing for thousands of years. Now that so many black men are imprisoned and they're promoting the homosexuality, why are they promoting homosexuality and at the same time promoting black women going to white males? It is pure, unadulterated genocide. Since 1914, we all been talking 100 years. That's why the whole integrationist movement started. It had nothing to do with us. We want access. We pay tax dollars. You got a library. We want access to the library. We want access to the schools. We want our children to be able to be doctors and lawyers. It had nothing to look. Why would we get off the plantation with the brutality that white folks gave us and then you think the masses of black people want to go back to white folk? We were trying to get as far away from them as possible. A few Negro leaders who was in love with white folks. Whites were able to get them because their idea is that gradually, instead of segregating them and keeping them to themselves so they stay strong, we are going to absorb this race into us and make them disappear. And what you're seeing now, they have us in such a bad condition that we're complicit with our own genocide through the absorption of the race. Now, like we always do, you know how we do. I can say this to you, but I know for some people it seems like a little much. It seems like somewhat of a stretch. I'm going to show you the whites telling you exactly what they're doing. If you think this is a stretch, consider this. The whole continent of Australia was black. Mm -hmm. Every inhabitant was black. That's Once they had murdered off the inhabitants of Australia, to the degree that there were few of them left, then the last part of the genocide process was to gradually absorb them into the white race and eliminate them in that manner. It's a movie called Rabbit Proof Fence. And we're gonna take a look just at a very brief clip because like we always say here, we can show you better than we can tell you. And no matter what, brothers and sisters, I know at this point you believe me, I know you do, but ain't nothing like hearing the devil talk about his intentions his goals and objectives, hearing it for yourself. So we're going to go and see what happened to our brothers and sisters in Australia and Tasmania and many different places all over the planet. As you know, every Aborigine born in this state comes under my control. Notice, if you will, the half-caste child. And there are ever-increasing numbers of them. Now, what is to happen to them? Are we to allow the creation of an unwanted third race? Should the coloreds be encouraged to go back to the black? Or should they be advanced to white status and be absorbed in the white population? Now, time and again, I am asked by some white man, if I marry this colored person, will our children be black? And as chief protector of Aborigines, it is my responsibility to accept or reject those marriages. Here is the answer. Three generations. Half-blood grandmother, quadroon daughter, octroon grandson. Now, as you can see, in the third generation, or third cross, no trace of native origin is apparent. The continuing 
infiltration of white blood finally stamps out the black color. The Aboriginal has simply been bred out. Now, we come to, we come to the Moor River Native Settlement. Ladies, most of you are familiar with our work here. The training of domestic servants and farm laborers, I would like to thank you for your continuing support. Hundreds of half-caste children have been gathered up and brought here to be given the benefit of everything our culture has to offer. For if we are to fit and train such children for the future, they cannot be left as they are. And in spite of himself, the native must be helped. I didn't lie to you, did I? No, sir, sir, sir. Sisters, particularly my sisters who are so fed up with black men, and I, to the, I cannot honestly see that you should not be fed up with us. The way that the black male is acting on this planet, he is not fit for love from anybody. But I want to just say this to you because of the truth. He don't love you. Matter of fact, if that white male loved you, he wouldn't have raped you to begin with. He wouldn't have enslaved you, and he wouldn't be killing your babies. If he loves you, he wouldn't be locking your men up when they're not committing crimes or shooting 50 times in the street. He don't love you. He wants you gone, and you can help him. <laughs> there you go, bro. Say it again, bro. He wants you gone, he wants your legacy gone, he wants your history gone, he wants your race gone, he wants the beautiful way that you walk and light this planet up with your beauty, he wants it gone. And you can help him. You know how you help him? You go to him and integrate. Once again, brothers and sisters, integration has been the key element in the destruction of black civilization. It is nothing designed to help black people it has always and will always be designed to destroy us. How does it help whites? They get our color. They get the strength of our organs. They get the DNA, uh, the, the melanin and the DNA that goes back to the beginning of time. What does a black, beautiful human being that has ancestry to before time began get from integration with Europeans? You get genocide. That's right. That's right. Now, we gotta talk brothers and sisters, I know. You say, I'm going to an integration lecture. It ain't going to be real heavy. It's heavy because we've been lied to so much. We think it's good. And when you see how bad it is, it's really, really painful. Because sometimes, you know, sometimes we get on the wrong track. But now we got to get back on the right track. And being back on the right track is we got to start making it mean something to have a black mother and a black father. I got, I got a black mother and a black father. Could you give me a, a round of applause? I feel good about that. And it don't seem like that's a lot, but... It's becoming a chore. Look, some of y'all got black mothers and fathers too. I just want to give y'all a clap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, black mothers and fathers. That went out there and did the right thing. But now we got to talk, and this is a hard discussion, but we got to have it. What's produced when a black man and a white female lay together? What's produced when a black woman lays down with a white male? What does history tell us? Let's go to history. Here goes Chancellor Williams, our black Bible. Now, they don't, the Bible ain't got no lies in it. Let's go to the Bible. To prove how truly white they were, the mixed Egyptians, we talking about thousands of years ago, made hatred of Africans a ritual and tried to surpass the whites in raiding for slaves in all African areas. Various mulattoes who became Egyptians' kings declared eternal warfare against black people and vow to enslave the entire race. Wow. Who are we talking about? <laughs> Look, I know it hurts some feelings, but we gotta start talking. Brothers and sisters, for people who don't know about Washington DC and why black people love Mary Berry, let me just give you a very brief description of who this man was so you'll understand. He had some problems with drugs. He said, why do you support a man? When that man came into power, Washington DC administration was own running controlled by white folks. Murray became mayor and said 33% of every dollar that goes to a contractor goes to a black person. Right. Murray said from 13 to 21, 
If you are 13 to 21 years old, you are absolutely, positively, guaranteed a job. That's why you got countless thousands of black people who grew up in Washington, D.C. that are in professional jobs now and have made it because we were able to stay off the, the main streets of Washington, D.C. and that Marinbury Youth Leadership Program and get people that loved us and trained us. And he fought, come on, clap, you from D.C. You got to clap. He forced them crackers to hire black people. They ain't had no choice. And many of us ain't in prison or dead today because of this man. He showed the kind of loyalty to black people that you do not see in politicians of today. You got to go back to the Adam Clayton Powell's and brothers of that day to see that kind of thing. That's why black people in D.C. love him. I'm not calling this, this thing here a black man. This thing, this mulatto, Adrian Fenty comes in and almost like he read the destruction of black civilization and said, I want to show you what mulattoes do. I want to be the best mulatto. Here you got the black police chief. Man, place, look, look, look at it. Black fire chief. I mean, that, that cracker got blew up. That cracker can tie a noose there. I don't, I don't know if he should have been ahead of the... He looked like he should have been the one ahead of the police. He's ready to kill some black folks. Can you kill black folks as a fire chief? I, if they don't, he looked like he's going to find a way. School superintendent. Oops. Boom. Almost, you know, because in the, in the destruction of black civilization, it says white Asiatics a lot, just because there was no Europe, then they call it Asiatics, but she's actually Asian. This is what's incredible. He's come in, you know, when you crawl out that filthy wound in Europe, you can't expect, man, this thing has come in, Adrian Fenty. Now he's doing massive firings in D.C. I'm talking about by the, by the hundreds, and he's firing all the black people. And literally, we know people that work there. On all the applications that they're accepting, the people they're hiring are all white and Asians. Literally, in a modern time, a black controlled city to the degree black people can control the city in America, a mulatto has come in and literally taken every game, every, they say almost every single solitary millionaire in PG County has Mary and Barry to thank for that. That Uncle Tom bootlicking Negro Robert Johnson that puts that monstrous stuff before us would have been a nobody if it wasn't for Mary and Barry. Say, here, take some TV and give our people something good. Did we all do the right thing with it? I'm not saying that, but let me tell you something. These mulattoes, brothers and sisters, as history tells us, he says, the mulatto has been the white man's most effective agent in helping destroy black civilization. That's powerful. He didn't say they helped. He's saying they have been the most effective assistant to the European. Brother says, he says, relying on the concept of being innately superior to black people, whites everywhere create a class that made their bastard offsprings next to them in status and superior to all black people. Don't talk about rock. No, no, we ain't gonna talk about rock. It ain't gonna go like that. I know. I know, so I gotta trick you sometimes. Sometimes you think it's going one way, but I ain't going the way you think I'm going. I ain't going where you think I might be, because y'all look at the old man. Don't do that. I know it's going with y'all, brother. Y'all see that pretty black wife in here, and you say, brother, don't do that. And I'm with you, but don't, don't you dare do it. No. <laughs> If we know, and listen, it ain't no if we know. Let me state it differently. It is an absolute fact. Listen, it's not, in 20 years, listen, this is what I'm saying to you. In 20 years, somebody's gonna say, man, that brother was brilliant. He told us this is what happened. No, ain't nothing brilliant about this. History speaks the truth. As a class, listen, as a class, as a group, historically, invariably, whether their mothers were white or whether their fathers were white, as a class, the mulatto in Haiti, in Africa, all throughout this planet has always sided with white folks. Why? I don't know. No, I do know. You want me to tell you why? Because when black people, when we get with white folks, our only thought is, oh, I'm with white folks. White folks, when they get with black people, they have an agenda and they make sure they put it in those children. So those children destroy us. But this is the problem. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass committed his life to working for black people. Adam Clayton Powell, he could have passed for white. But I don't know where we'd be without, without Adam Clayton Powell's working with black people. Bob Marley financed the end of the Angolan Revolution, from what I understand. Washington. Yeah, Booker T. Washington. He said, up you mighty, I mean, he, he, he didn't say up you mighty, right? but he said, up from slavery. But he got, he tricked white folks into financing black institutions 
I mean, the reality of it is, we can't just say all mulattoes are bad. Right. But at the same time that's happening, we have to protect ourselves against the mulatto class. Because right. as a class, they're going 20 years from now, black people are going to hate mulattoes worse than you angry white folks. I mean, it ain't might be, this is what history says. Right. Because the thing Agent 50 does is just a glimpse into what the mulattoes are going to do to black people. Right. Don't have time to get into it. You got to read for yourself and go through the history. But we got to figure out what do we do. Right. And I say, this is what I say is a fair thing. And why I put Barack Obama up, because the perfect example. If a person, see there's, there's a stronger requirement for mulatto than a, than a black person with a black mother and father. If you got a white parent, then if you declare yourself loyal to black people, meaning like Barack Obama, he married a black woman. You state that you are black. Right. And you take positions in favor of black people consistently. Right. Then as far as we concern, you black. Right. Why not? I mean, Adam Clayton Powell was black, and I don't want to hear who his parents were. I know who he fought for and who he stood with. He black. Frederick Douglass fought slavery and did a good job. He married a white female at the end of his life, but, you know, I mean, you know, he's a model. But no, no, he's a black man who made a mistake. <laughs> a bad one. A bad one. Real bad one. But, <laughs> but unforgetting all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying this is how we this is how we deal with it. Barack Obama's married with a black woman, isn't he? A real black woman, right? I mean, don't have no indication she don't want to be black. In all fairness, he looks like a black man, he acts like a black man. Right now, he is a black man. He gets in power if he become president, and he said, you know what? The black farmers had their land stolen. I'm gonna start a special commission. The black farmers gonna get their land back. And I'm going to have another uh, you know, part of the process, getting the crops redone, and we're going to follow it all the way through to get the stuff to market. We say, man, go on, brother. Yeah. Barack Obama get in office. Barack Obama said, you know, uh, all these brothers been locked up. We got this DNA testing now. We got brothers been in jail for 25 years. They didn't have nothing to do with the crime. Right. Wasn't in the same city of the crime. We're going to do this DNA test. I want a special commission. Don't nobody else in the society get nothing except uh, until this gets done. We say, go ahead, brother. That's why we want a brother in office. He go out there and say, we got to start bringing some of the jobs back to America. We don't have enough jobs here. It's jobs. And we say, man, thank you. This is a good thing that a brother's in office. He's a brother. Barack Obama gets in office and decides, black people, you got to stop being so homophobic. <laughs> Barack Obama gets in office and starts talking out against Hugo Chavez. Okay. Barack Obama starts getting in there and starts doing everything that we would say, oh, okay, he's working on behalf of the white folks. You know what we say? Typical mulatto, that's what we expect. <laughs> what else can No, no, I'm serious. Look, we got to understand something. And it's not our fault. Look, if somebody came in this room and punched me in the face and knocked me on the ground, and then they picked somebody else up and threw them on top of me, and then the white boy jumped on the very top, here's my question to you. Who's keeping me down? Mm. Who's keeping me down? The white boy. The white boy, right. You sure? No, no, no. Who's keeping me down? One on you saying the one on top of you? One on the you saying they both up? Oh, no. The best answer, it depends. <laughs> if the person in the middle position is, brother, when we get this white boy off the top of us, we gonna whoop his ass. <laughs> right on, brother. <laughs> if the person on top of me say, master, go ahead and get some water. I got him down here, he's okay. Then both of them keeping us down. That's the problem with the mulattoes. We don't know what they're going to do. That is not our fault. Black man, if you have the common decency to keep white females out of your bed and lay down with a black woman when you want intimacy, we won't have no more of these problems. Black woman, if you have the common decency to keep the white male out of your bed, we won't have these problems to contend with. We don't make the problems. We have to deal with them. That's the fairest way to be. If they loyal to us, they black people, we don't think twice about it. The minute they take the side of the cracker, they mulattoes and they typical mulattoes, and we expect it exactly what we do. We got to turn on them just like they turn on us. Is that fair enough? Fair, fair enough. Let's go with it. So if you're voting, if you vote, you got to vote for the black man. Because as it stands, he's a black man. Come on, get some, get some love for that. And if you ain't voting, don't get upset. Then just don't. I ain't say you got you. But if you do, it's only one way to go. And brother and sister, what I'm saying, I'm going to say it one more time because it's critical. Don't have time to get deep into it. I promise you, it's going to mean something to you in the future. We are going, in 20 years, we're going to have a crisis with the mulattoes who are going to side with Europeans. And they're going to do things to us that we can't possibly imagine today. Let us be prepared to deal with the fact 
that this is coming. Established today is something special for a black man to be with a black woman. This is Ethiopia where I was at the Gihon Hotel. And all they were doing in the month of January was all these weddings. And I didn't see any, I mean, I must have seen two, 3,000 people. And all of them were black. And so we saw a black family. And so I want to arm you, brothers and sisters, because some people say, that's hard, man. How do I talk to my family and tell them I'm against integration and the marriage? How do I do it? I'm going to give you something simple that all of us can stand on. It takes a black man and a black woman to start a black family. Check? Check. A black man and a white female, it's a mixed family, right? right. right. A black female, a black woman, and a white male, that's what? Mixed. It's a mixed family. Right. Only way to get a black family, black man and a black woman. Therefore, if you believe in the black family, you must be against interracial marriage and or interracial dating. So next time you're at the house and it comes up and you say, no, I'm against it, I don't agree with it, and they start, the family starts jumping on you, you got them. Say, well, it's just that I believe in the principles of a black family. And a black family requires a black man to be with a black woman. 90% of the brothers and the sisters in the room, well, no, nah, I understand you say it, I agree. They're going to come on your side, but you always got that Uncle Tom. <laughs> you always got that person that got their special agenda that's going to fight with you. Yeah. And you know what you tell them? Yeah. When it gets to that point, you say, well, listen, we have a fundamental difference. I believe in black family. You don't. Yeah. So let's not have this discussion any further. Yeah. And leave it right there. Like How about that? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, there's no love the world has ever known like the love between a black man and black woman. Let's start taking pride in that reality. Got to do it real quick, can't leave it out. What happens to us spiritually through forced integration? Chancellor Williams says, as in the case of Islam, Christi, Christian conversion meant changing into the white man's image, his ideas and value system. The real object of worship turned out to be neither Jesus Christ nor his father God, but Western man and Western civilization. Woo! Get that? Oh, that's it right there. Come on. So we got to ask a question. Quick test. Who's that? Right. Who's that? Also known, that's why Sirap is also known as who? Jesus. Jesus. Who's that? Right. Also known as who? Jesus. Who that? Jesus. That's right. I need one answer. Come on. Give me, give me, give me. I need to hear you. Who? Jesus. That's right. Who that? Jesus. Who that? Jesus. Who that? Jesus. That's right. Who's that? Jesus. Who's that? <laughs> Who's that? Jesus. 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 <laughs> My God. All I'm saying, I got a question. I got a question, though. Is he the same guy as him? No. they two different people, right? Is he the same guy as him? No. But they all Jesus. They're all different individuals, but they all Jesus. So then who is Jesus? White. <laughs> what do they all have in common? They white what? Like white males. I think they males, right? They, they look male. Yeah, they, they white males. What does that mean? <laughs> the white male's God. <laughs> look, look, I look. I, I know that it's real simple. If you put me on there and you put Kush on there, you put D on there, you wouldn't say, that's Kush, Kush, Kush. <laughs> you wouldn't do it. All I got to do is find a frizzy head cracker. He can be blonde hair. He can have white hair. He can have blue eyes, brown eyes. As long as he looked kind of gay and kind of soft, I throw him up on a... I say as long as he... I didn't say he was gay. I'm just saying if I was to make my own personal assessment of the way he looked to me, I would say he fruity as a cocktail salad. That's what I would say. You might not agree. But my point is, if the white male is God, and that's who we've been worshiping as an image, which we can't deny since we can recognize any white male with long hair is Jesus, then I got a question. Are we not in a condition as a race of people that we need somebody to save us? Yes, sir. Then I'm, I'm keeping it real. <laughs> who looks like, I need a real quick, yeah, who looks like they'd be more likely to come back and save black? I'm saying, you don't have to know who they are. I'm asking an honest question. We need somebody to come help black people. Does he look like he's not? I'm saying, you might not know who he is. Which one I need you to help me by, by round of applause? Is it this one? Or is it this one? I'm a cheat now, because I know you all know who she is. And we need somebody to come get us some freedom. Do it look like he be more likely to do it, or she be more likely to do it? Well, then we got new gods and new images on our walls. Our ancestors said, 
Whatever you put on your walls is what you worship. So if you're in a black home now and you got your grandparents and your family all around your walls, good for you. You worship your ancestors. If you got John F. Kennedy and Abraham Lincoln on the wall, you got some work to do. <laughs> and now I know you're saying, but that's Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. What are you talking about? Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad was only a man. I mean, he was a great man. He's an ancestor now, but this is our God, Tahaka and Nzinka. You say, well, why would you change their names? I didn't change their names. They're Africans. They got to have African names. And it's okay. I went and talked to Dr. Khaled last night. I said, Doc, we got some work to do. We got to use your powerful image. He said, you know what I'm doing? He said, that's all right, son. Just make sure he's a killer. I said, yes, sir. He said, oh, by the way, son. I said, yes, sir. He said, make sure you tell them kites that they still ain't no goddamn good. Whites, so-called Jews, small hats, kites. You ain't no goddamn good. I mean, I'm not trying to be indecent, but I, the doc told me to do it. I'm going to say no. <laughs> I went to Sister Harry and I said, Sister, she said, boy, I ain't got no time for this. I'm busy. I said, but, she said, I said yes, ma'am. She said, you know who to pick. You know, Harry and Tommy, she was busy working down here. She's working for us right now, too. Queen and Zinga. And Zinga. That's a name that we can stand on because she won and she went to her grave fighting for our people. And so... These are our new gods and goddesses, brothers and sisters. I want to see them on your wall. I want to come to your house and look around. And next time I talk to your son, I'm going to put a picture of Garvey up there and Nat Turner and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. I'm going to say, young man, who is that? He's going to say, God? And who is that? God? And when I put her up there and I'd be well my that your child going to say, goddess? That's how we got to change this thing around. All right, let's do it. We're moving out of here. We all, y'all all right? No, we got a little, we got a little bit to go. Y'all all right? Let's get a little bit. The doctor, the educator, the good book, he said, the Negro integrationists are hostile to the black revolution and aim to defeat its main aims by forcing black children and youth of the nation more directly under white education. Once again, as in slavery, they will be cut off from the history of their race. Who are we talking about? We got a veritable corporate of wannabe white folks that they made to look like and make us think are our heroes. I want to tell you one important thing about all of these Negroes. The vast majority of the so-called leadership in the black community who outwardly and aggressively profess themselves to be integrationists, the vast majority of them are either cracker lovers or they faggots. I'm going to say it one more time. Listen, the vast majority of the individuals who self-proclaim themselves supposed to be leaders, and they say we're integrationists, and they promote this integration, are cracker lovers or faggots. Let's look at Dr. Martin Luther King. Y'all know he wanted to marry a white female, right? Mm -hmm. He tried to marry her. Her father said, no. Betty Motes. Now, Betty Motes, small head, now you understand why he was so desiring for us to get in with white folks, because they want to be with white folks. Uh, ben Rustin, he didn't like white females. He preferred white males. Yes, sir. Right. All of, you know, do you know that this Uncle Tom trader, I don't got time to get into it today, but Thurgood Marshall, do you know that this trader married an uh, Asian female? You thought he had a black wife, didn't you? No, he didn't. And nothing but a bunch of veritable, look, W.E.B. Du Bois. You know why Du Bois uh, eventually at the end of his life tried to start helping Africa? Because he tried to start a caste system in America. He wanted light-skinned black people with education to be a middle mulatto class above the masses of our people. And the white folks said, look here, little boy, you ain't getting in. Then he decided after he helped them destroy Garvey, destroy all the true Africans who really had the interests of the masses of our people in mind, this Negro used to sit around and call the UNIA the ugliest niggas in America. It was the Universal Negro Improvement Association where black people, you could be a sharecropper, you could be unemployed, you could be any black person. Our objective was worldwide to bring ourselves together. These Uncle Tom Negroes were trying to set up a privileged class in this country. And they teach them that these are our, our leaders and saviors. No, brothers and sisters, Brown versus the Board of Education. You're going to fight so that the same whites that bomb your churches and kill your daughters call you nigger and lynch you, and for that you tell them, I want you to educate my child. What kind of mad integrationist Negro mindset do we have? Bobby Wright tells us that the only thing we got, the only thing we got out of this 
education integration system when the schools integrated was that the black principals in black schools ended up as janitors in the white schools. If they had a job. You think that a black man and a black woman who's part of a community is not going to spend more time and energy trying to educate your child than some white that's trying to kill you anyway? Got a sister I was talking to her just recently, right up in Baltimore County. Crazy story. I, I almost didn't believe it myself. I believe the first part, but the end was just crazy. She told me she was having a problem with this teacher. Her son was uh, at the school, one of the few black children in the class. White teacher, primarily white class. She said, son raised his hand. She, teacher didn't rate, call his hand. And he made some kind of gesture or something. So she said she'd been having problems with the teacher. She decided she was going to go meet with her. She said, the teacher said since he made some kind of gesture in class, she took some points off his test. So she said, that don't sound right. So I was talking to her, I said, this is a racist. I said, now maybe, I said, maybe, I ain't sure. I said, maybe that's a part of her regular routine, taking points off everybody's test, but I ain't never heard that in my life. Right. I told her exactly what to do. I said, go in there, sit down with that white female, look her in her eye, let her talk, make sure you make your son be quiet. Don't say nothing, because they're going to try to provoke you. Right. I said, then you look her in her face, and when she finishes, I heard everything you said. I came here, I said, look her there in the eye. I came here to ensure that this is not about white racism, because it is, it won't be tolerated. Right. I said, all you got to do is say that, and she will crack. Right. Right. She said, she sat down there, let her talk, and she said, you know, I just came here to make sure that nothing racial was going on. She said, the white female, oh, I got white, black friends, and no, <laughs> your son is just the best one in the world. But here's where the story takes a twist. Because she said she was backing up so fast, she said she had to hold her face. She said she did exactly what, I said, what the brother said. So she said, well, do you always take points off of children's tests when they do bad? She said, no, I, this is my first time I ever did that when I did it with your son. But I just thought it should be done. So she said, well, it's not going to be done. She said, oh, no, it won't be done. And when we come back from spring break, everything is going to be great. And everything is going to be okay then. Then, <laughs> this, this part of it, I was like, what? She looked down and looked at all her tons test scores and said, 20 out of 100. That don't sound like my son to get 20 out of 100. He, he's a much better student than this. I don't understand. The white female, she had the principal, assistant principal in there sitting with her. She looked at her. Oh, I made such a mistake. She, he actually got 20 out of 20. He got 100%. Wow. I just made a mistake. Oh, let me, let me erase that. Oh, that'll be taken care of. Wow. I said, whoa. I said, well, these low life crackers. That's what they do. They ain't changed the lick. They identified those youth, those black youth that they say will be promising. See, her student is a star athlete, great student in all of his classes, promising young man, not getting in the type of trouble that our other youth get. Right. And what thanks do they get when they go in there with white instruction? Right. To be targeted for failure. Yeah, she saved her son in that situation. Her son is guaranteed a good grade now, because when you pull that cracker to the carpet, they always fold. Right. When you can bring that cracker down to a man to man, woman to woman, face to face, reality, you can beat him every time. Problem is he don't fight like that. <laughs> it's a nice thought, but it don't work that way. But when you do it, you generally, black people win. But what about the countless masses of them youth that have parents that are not properly parenting and don't listen to their children when they come home? They destroy us in these educational systems, brothers and sisters. We are crazy to want to integrate with people that hate us. Who we talk? We getting out of here. We ain't much longer. I got to talk about it, though. I mean, they setting this Negro up to be the next leader. And I mean, if this ain't the most pleading, begging this, I mean, there's a multitude of issues we could talk to, but I'm gonna tell you, I listened one day, I heard this show, and I actually tried to call this Negro up, because I was gonna talk to him. I was say, look, make sure you don't put me on the air what I got to say to you. <laughs> it's one thing to be a traitor, but it's another thing to do open treason in front of your people. Right. Now listen, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael Bazin, one of the most successful black personalities in this country. His entire audience is primarily black. Am I correct? Yes. If Hispanics stop listening to him, would it affect his ratings? No. If white folks stop listening to him, would it affect his ratings? No. If anybody else, but if black people stop listening to him, he'd be off the air, right? Right. So we are loyal to him. We don't say, well, Monday I'm going to listen to a Hispanic. Tuesday I'm going to listen to somebody else. Wednesday I'm going to we say he's black. We're going to listen to him and show him loyalty. Every day he gets on the air. That's right. Well, white folks and Hispanics, we got to do all this stuff. But one day it just it went too far. Oh. He said, I'm bringing in DJs, and we want to bring people into the DJ field, and I'm helping people get in. But I don't want all black people. I want a rainbow. I want black people, whites, Asians. I said, wait a minute. You're going to tell us who are loyal to you that you ain't going to be loyal to us. Yeah, Brothers and sisters, we got to start calling these Negroes to the carpet. Are you a man? If you're a man, take a position. Are you a black man? Are you loyal to us? 
If so, then let us see that. If not, get out. We are not going to support you. That's how we got to be with these Negroes. Open treason is the Negroes. Uh-oh. I know. Oh, no, you didn't say the fiddler. Is that a new superhero? No, 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 no. <laughs> Look, we've been waiting for years. We ain't been trying to do it because, you know, sometimes things are surreal. I got to cross honest to God. Brother, would you check this for me? A brother called me this morning. Bro, I just rolled past the mosque, and I saw some white Jews walking in the mosque. He said, it disturbed me so bad, I doubled back around to make sure I was saying what I was saying. I said, maybe they're going to hurt him or something. He said, they opened the door and welcomed them into the mosque. You got white fruit now. How you going to hang? That's like a spoiled fruit. How you going to have a white fruit? Toussaint Louverture, Minister Louis Farrakhan, it's fair to say at this point in time, we can be honest, these were Negroes who were always integrationists. Always integrationists, but they made major contributions to our race. And the only place, I just want to make one point here because I don't know the answer to this. I want to make this and we're going to get on out of here. I mean, we're going to move right, right to the end, but I... Integrationists don't die with us, brothers and sisters. But there are times when our people are so down and so downtrodden that the best leadership will come from someone who in their heart of hearts is an integrationist. And they will do a great job for us. And in the beginning, we will not be able to identify them from a nationalist. Right. It'll be sometimes so bad that the, the nationalist will say, we need our own schools. White folks are not doing nothing for us. They're destroying us. We need our own schools. We need our own institutions. We need a strong community. And the integrationists will say, we need our own school. We need our own stores and institutions. We need a strong black community. You can't tell them apart until you ask them the question as a nationalist. Why do you want that? Because if we're going to do anything for ourselves as a race, we must do it for ourselves and realize that these are our enemies and they're not going to ever help us. we got to do it for ourselves. You ask the integrationists. Why do you do that? He says, because if we don't do something for ourselves, then whites will never respect us and accept us as equal. Mm. Problem? The only thing that the whites can offer the true nationalists is a better weapon to fight them with. But the one thing that the whites always have in their favor when you're dealing with integration, they can always say when the things look rough, they can say, we'll let you in. Come on in. And let me tell you, when the integrationist gets that carrot offered to them by the European, that he can get in. They will turn on us like there is no tomorrow. Drop us like a can of soup and throw us to the wolves. How we manage to figure out how we put term limits on integrationists who do a good job for us, I don't know how we do it, but at some point we're going to have to do it. You can take us as far as you can take us and contributing to our race, but when the time comes that you're no longer, your service is no longer needed and you can't take us any further, we say thank you, we appreciate you, we honor you forever. But we start taking instructions from new people who can keep us going the right direction, brother and sister. Have to make that point. We're going to get out of here with one last exercise. Y'all got enough? Yeah, should I end it right here? We can do one last exercise. One last exercise, and then we, we done. I said, you know what? I don't want to end this by not taking a real case scenario. Right here, while we living, this is happening right now. Ain't no history, it's history in the making. Right now, while we're living, what we're about to watch is happening. I'm gonna show you some clips. Now, I spliced it up intentionally. I'm not gonna tell you why it happened. But you're gonna have to answer the question, what happened to create this scenario once you watch it? Now, you gotta pay real close attention. Like I said, I spliced it up. You're gonna see a lot of different stuff coming at you. You got to figure out why this happened because brothers and sisters, as we look around the planet, our people are chopping each other up, killing each other, famine and all these things going on. And the question is, why is this happening? Right. We got to become more sophisticated. We got to already know the answer. We got to know who we are, who our enemies are and what happens to make us the way we are. Right. So I want to ask you one question before we start. Do y'all remember the two components of integration? Anybody? What's the first component? Miscegenation. Miscegenation, that's right. Race mixing, horizontal integration. What's the second? Destruction of civilization. Race whitening. Race whitening and race whitening. Accepting white standards of thinking and behavior over our own. That's right. So some people took their notes. I like that. All right, we're going to watch something. I want you to answer the question. What happened in this situation to make this happen? Y'all ready? A pretty amazing story of feminism, African style. 
a remote village where women rule and where men have been reduced to mere genetic necessities, if you know what I mean. And oddly enough, this is occurring in one of the most patriarchal parts of the world. To see this lifestyle for herself and discover its raison d'etre, Liz Tardich travelled to the far north of Kenya. This could easily be mistaken for a typical Samburu village in northern Kenya, where women do all the work while men laze around all day. But there's something very different about this Samburu village. Men are forbidden to live here. Women rule in the village of Amoja. We don't allow the men in this village. Turning Samburu patriarchy on its head has angered the men so much that they've recently started to mount daytime raids. But do you think that attacking the women is the way to go? Mm. Yeah. Sammy Griffiths runs a safari camp next to the nature reserve. They like this one. Yeah. She'd like the wives of her workers to emulate the success of a moja. We're starting our shop, but the ladies where we are as yet haven't had anything to do with tourism. So they need to learn a lot from Rebecca and her girls as to how they can make their produce suitable for people who would like to come and buy it and to support the community. Sammy Griffiths wants Rebecca to help set up a similar venture near her safari camp. Yes, it's a good beer. Getting the women back to the men is now the sole concern of Sebastian Lesnik, the chief of all the villages in this region. The chief is satisfied that some of the men are willing to have a reconciliation meeting. So the next day, he sets out to convince the women. Rebecca arrives and the women reluctantly gather to hear what the chief has to say. Don't be harsh to me anyway. I'm not, I'm not your husband. I'm just a peacemaker person. <laughs> and I would like to come and, you, and uh, talk to you while we arrange a day, uh, one day that will make you together with, the, with the, uh, your, your men. But when we go back, we get the same problems and you will be not there. But we will be there because uh, absolutely we are going to... I'm assuring you that we'll take care of you. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I'm going to get you. Being separated, separating the children is very bad. That's yeah, the why children, the children that, belongs to both of us. Yes, but uh, you have... Men's and women, no problem. <coughs> and you know... We take care of the children, even always they don't take care of the children. We do take yeah, care of the children. But you if know... If they get problems with the crocodile bite yeah. there, we just assist them. Mm. But they don't assist us. Keep you just tell them, leave these women, <coughs> give them peace, don't disturb them. On 